Of course, that never has happened in many Sunday morning to any of us, hasn't it? <laughs> um, the first time I saw this video was a great impact on me because it displayed a lot of truth for my own personal life. It's very easy to disconnect our daily lives to the truth of the gospel, right? As easy as it was for this family to start their morning in total warfare and then get a church and have a smiley face and sing praise God the Father in whom all, from whom all blessings flow. Um, that happens often to us. We forget that the gospel has an impact. We forget that the gospel has implications. It's the whole theme of this conference. We are focusing on Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, which is the application, the living out of the truth of the gospel. The purpose of this workshop is to remember a little bit the, the awe, the surprise, the greatness of that gospel, of the good news that we have. We're all able to state the gospel in a few words. We're all able to, you know, Tell people, you know, Jesus Christ is God. He's completely holy. He died for you and for your sins. If you believe in Him, you can be forgiven. And He also resurrected and He wants to give you eternal life. We're able to do that. But because we're able to do it so well, because we remember it every Sunday morning, we often forget how powerful, how amazing, how incredibly awe-inspiring this message is. So my hope is that in the next minutes, as we go through Ephesians and we, you know, review a couple of the things that Paul is reminding us, that from where the gospel comes from, that gets into our heads, gets stuck into our hearts, and makes an impact so we don't have this disconnection between the gospel and our daily lives, but we connect it and we're able to live it out. So if you have your Bibles with you, open them up to Ephesians chapter 1. And you might want to have a pencil or a pen and you have some uh, space for notes in your little uh, booklets over there. Now, if you see worksheet number three, there's an outline there and there's just an outline with blanks. The outline is the same outline that the outline has blanks, okay? So don't worry about the blanks. It's already there. Uh, what I do want you to do is use the blank space here and on the other side of that page uh, to make some of the notes of what we're gonna do next, all right? Now let's start with uh, Ephesians chapter 1, okay? Now, uh, if you got your Bibles in there, I want you to go fairly quickly through the first chapter, okay? We're going to do a study of Ephesians, all of us here quickly, okay? And I want you to count, okay, how many times do you see the sentence or the word in Christ or in Him, okay? So count them and write down what verses do you find that in, okay? In Ephesians chapter 1, how many times you find in Him or in Christ, and where do you find them? <laughs> All right. So, if you did not finish, don't worry about it. That's a great exercise to do. Now, it would be easier for me to just put in a PowerPoint and tell you it's this many times in all these many verses, but there's a reason why I want you to read it. I want you to find it out. I want you to realize how important this word is and that you're getting it from Scripture that Paul is making a very strong emphasis here. Now, how many times did you get? Nine, ten. 10 over here, who gives me 11, 11 number for one. Anybody got more than 10? Okay, so in just, you know, a couple of verses, uh, we have 10 times Paul saying, in him, in Christ, in him, in Christ. So what is the emphasis? What is Paul trying to emphasize here, to tell us that we need to really get in the back of our heads? What do you think it is? Okay, good. So apart from him, we are nothing. What else? Satisfaction is found in him. 
Okay, so satisfaction is found in him. Good. Any more ideas? So he's our foundation. He's our foundation. Good. Dennis, you were going to say something? It's about, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus Christ. Okay. So, yes. I mean, take a look at that. Paul is going to talk about inefficiency, okay? And he will talk about the gospel. He will talk about eternity. He will talk about marriage. He will talk about everything that happens. But as he starts in chapter 1, he wants us to realize everything that we have is positional. It means that it's because we are in certain position. And that position is in Christ. Everything, every blessing, every good thing that we have happens because we are in Him. Just take a look a little bit at some of the things that the blessings we experience in them. Just in verse 3, we're, said, we're told that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Then verse 4, He chose us in Him. Uh, in verse, uh, at the end of verse uh, 6, He has blessed us in the Beloved. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption. At uh, the end of verse uh, 9, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ. Verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite us all things in him. Verse 11, in him we have obtained inheritance. Verse 12, this says, who we were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So the promise of the Spirit of God, the redemption of our, of our, you know, of our lives, the forgiveness, the eternal blessings we have in heaven, they're all in one single place. They're all in the position of being in Christ. Now that reminds us of John, right, 15, where Jesus says, I am the vineyard, right? You're the branches. If you're separated or apart from me, there's nothing you can do. Where does, why? Because where does every blessing and everything we have come from? It comes from the life that we have in Christ. Now, I know this sounds like a very elementary Sunday school concept, but it is key to the rest of the book of Ephesians. It is key to the gospel, and it is key to the application that we're going to have in chapters 4, 5, and 6. You see, as as our brother was saying this morning, it's often that we do the separation between the doctrine and the application. But it is the doctrine that dives the application. And this doctrine, that everything we have good comes from being in Christ, applies to chapter 4, 5, and 6. So if we're talking about the unity in the body, if we're talking about the blessings in marriage, if we're talking about raising our children, if we're talking about uh, living this life and fighting the spiritual battle that we're having, it all comes down to one concept, being in Christ. Now that's going to be foundation, okay? And I'm just going to lay it there simply saying, you know, whenever you're going back to these next chapters or in your life, you know, as you want to apply the gospel to your marriage, the gospel to the way we treat our children, the gospel to the way we behave as workers, the gospel to the way that we study, the gospel in every area of our lives, there is one foundation that we need to remember. We have to remain in Christ, okay? What does that mean? How does that look like? I think that will look like, like differently in different situations, right? But I just want you to quickly answer these questions, okay? As a couple, if I'm married, how are we abiding in Christ? You know, how are we abiding in Him? What are we doing as a couple to abide in Christ? As a student, as a single man, what am I doing to abide in Him? How do I stay in that position of blessing in which God has put me? Uh, as a father, how do I lead my children? How do I put my children in that position of blessing, of being in Christ? I think that's foundation. If we want to apply the gospel to all of our lives, we start by from whom comes the blessing of the gospel, and that's from being in Christ. Okay? Now, as we turn to a second point, I just want you to notice something, and it's who is at work in the gospel? Like, what is required for the gospel to work? And you will see the Trinity is working here in chapter 1. Right? We start on verse number three, and we have, Blessed be the 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who is the one who initiates every blessing and every action in the book of Ephesians in chapter 1? It's God the Father, right? It's the Father. Through whom does He send every blessing? Through the Son, through Jesus Christ. But then as you go to verse uh, 15 and 16, uh, we read then that also he, sorry, verse uh, 13, we read that we have been sealed with a promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it for the praise of His glory. So we have at the end of this, the Holy Spirit sealing this gift and as the guarantee, the promise that His work will be done in us. So you see the whole Trinity. You see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work in our lives as we're getting the gospel. How do we get blessed? How does the gospel work? Is through the Trinity, okay? Now, as you go, keep going through Ephesians, you get to this great prayer, right? The prayer that's in verse 15 uh, to verse 23. It's a uh, thanksgiving and prayer, but it's an eye-opening prayer. Now, I want you, you to look at a couple of things that are said here. Um, you know, verse 18, these are some of the things that Paul is asking God for. Having the eyes of our heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, right? And then what are the riches of his, inglorious, of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. So just want you to see something. When you read chapter 1, you know, the first... 14 verses. They seem very elevated, right? I mean, often they just go over our heads. You know, we read all these blessings. Sometimes, you know, you see someone who's really excited about them. Uh, sometimes you read them and you're like, oh, this is great. But very often, I don't know if this has happened to you, uh, these kind of things just go over our heads and we forget. Like, we don't we don't really engage on like, oh, wow, yes, I'm really blessed in Christ. Um, and I think that has to do with why Paul is putting this prayer here. There's actually two prayers in the book of Ephesians, right? There's one right here, verse 15 through 22, and then in chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And they are in very key positions, okay? They're right after Paul has just expounded great truths, very deep truths, about the gospel. See, in chapter 1, Paul expounds all the blessings in eternity that we have. And this, like, great explanation, right? All the things we have in him. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, Paul talks about how the gospel works and the implications of the gospel for the unity of the body, right? Chapter 2 and chapter 3. These are also great expositions. And he ends those two expositions with two very, very powerful prayers. Okay, if you look at the prayer in chapter 1, he's asking God to what? Open the eyes, right? Enlighten the eyes. What does that mean? What does that image of enlightening your eyes, of opening the eyes uh, mean to you? What does it carry? Sorry? To reveal. Thank you. What else? I say, open my eyes. What does that mean? Gain a new perspective. Okay, thank you. Gain a new perspective. Good. What else? Okay, to see through God's eyes. Very good. Now, the thing is, we can read it, we can list it, we can even say it, but we may not really be seeing it. We, could, we, we may not really be understanding it and it requires the power of God in our lives to enlighten us so that we truly know and understand all the richness that we have in him look at how much power is required to work in our lives as you see in verse 20 you see that power is the power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the power that it, Paul asks to be at work at us is the same power that it took 
to raise Christ from the dead and lift him up and put him in the heavenly places. That is what Paul is saying. Please, God, open their eyes, enlighten them so that they know what is the hope they've been called to. And then on chapter 3, look at the prayer in chapter 3. In chapter 3, you have 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. But according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Holy Spirit and your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ. So here is Paul, right? The master teacher, the, the master expounder of Scripture. He just wrote, you know, a great passage, chapter 2, chapter 3, explaining very well, very specifically, what we are in Christ and how big the love of Christ is. But he knows that is not enough. Just the exposition, just the explanation is not enough. You require the power of God. You require the working of the Holy Spirit. You require the enlightenment and the opening of the eyes and of our understanding to truly know the love of God, to truly understand the hope. And that's the second thing that I would like you to think as we try to apply the gospel to our daily lives. Number one is the position we have, right? It's all in Christ. How do I abide in Christ? But number two is, where does the power come from to apply the gospel to my daily life? Where does the power come from to see the love of Christ when I'm in, when I'm in the midst of affliction or in the midst of routine, which sometimes is even harder, isn't it? Uh, I'll be honest, for me, it's easier to see God when I'm in affliction because I really need Him than it is when I'm in the routine of you know, getting in the wake up, go to work, uh, do this, come back, go back. You no, know, when I'm in that mode, it's harder to see at God at work there. But what is needed? Because I do need Him. I do need to live out the gospel every day. You know, as I go to work, as I'm driving, uh, as I wake up, how I deal with my wife, uh, how I come back from work, you know, how I deal with the stress of job. Everything, all of those things need the gospel. I need the gospel. I need the redemption of Christ in those things in my life. How do I get to that? And I think Paul makes a great point. It's not just the understanding or the simply knowing. It requires prayer. He says, I, I kneel down. I bow down before the Father. And I pray that He may enlighten your eyes, that He opens our eyes, that He may strengthen you in your inner being. And often we forget that's a very important part of application. You know, we jump quickly to the lists, the 10 things you can do to uh, have a better marriage, or 10 things you can do to raise uh, well-behaved kids, or, you know, five things to do to uh, deal with your road rage. I don't know. Um, and uh, we want to do that. And we know, you know, in the back of our minds, in our hearts, we know, like, the way I'm behaving is not the way that I'm supposed to, and I want some change. So we try to do stuff. I'm not saying don't do stuff. I'm not saying the lists are bad, okay? The lists are great. What I'm saying is the power to live that out, you know, the power to transform the way you're thinking, the way you're living, comes firstly from the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds to truly open them to see, to understand, and to know the hope and the love that we have in Christ. You see, when we have hope, which is the prayer in chapter 1, when we understand this hope of all these blessings that await us, that eclipses completely the afflictions that are before us, right? That's what Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians. He says this, small afflictions that are here with us do not compare to the great riches that await for us in heaven, you know? And when Paul says that, I always, like at first, I, I got so mad the first time I read that because I thought small afflictions? So Paul, you're calling cancer a small affliction? Paul, you're calling a dad who lost his job and is been in bankruptcy for 10 years, a small affliction. Uh, Paul, you're calling the affliction that, uh, you know, a mother goes through as they're giving birth and then they're at home and the desperation. Uh, is that a small affliction? They don't seem like small afflictions to me. They're actually 
pretty big, especially if you're going through one, right? But here's what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is they're small when they're compared to the greatness of God. So it's like this. You might see my shoes and say they're big, um, size 12, which is a big size. But if you take a tennis shoe from Shaquille O'Neal and you set that right beside my tennis shoe, you're going to see that my shoe is small. But it's small, why? Because it's compared to Shaquille O'Neal's tennis shoe. So that's what hope does for us. It changes the perspective of how we see things here on earth. So what, you know, the little things that our wives or children may do to irritate us, the things we do in our lives that might irritate us, they change. Perspective change. My work changes. The way I'm driving changes because my perspective changes. Why? Because by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, through the position I now have in Christ, I have a different perspective. And I achieve that through prayer. Okay, so my second question for you this morning uh, is, number one, how are you abiding in Christ? Number two, in all those different, you know, practical daily life things, you know, how are you searching? How are you you know, pleading, how are you looking for the power of God to live out your life, to understand Him and to know Him more? That is key for really living out the gospel. Now, let's turn to chapter 2. As we turn to chapter 2, uh, we are talking about the cost of the gospel. Now, this is a chapter that is... Uh, taught many times, right? We read it very often on our worship meetings. Um, so I just want to do a short exercise with this. Uh, most of you are in couple, uh, like sitting down beside someone else. So uh, I would like to, you to read to each other, okay? Verses 1 through verses 10, okay? So take like one verse each and read it to each other uh, in the next, uh, you know, minute and a half. Yeah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. You can take turns and read it to each other if you want. Okay. Now, we're going to do a second round, but I want you to do something different this time, okay? Now, I want you to switch all the yous and we's for I. Okay, so I'll give you an example. You know, verse 1 says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world. So you would read, For and I was dead in the trespasses and sins, in which I once walked following the course of this world. Okay, so same exercise, read it to each other, but change the you and the we's for I. Okay, good. Thank you. Now, there's a reason I asked you to do this. The reason is we are so used for the gospel to be for them. And we forget that the gospel is mainly for us. That I need the gospel and I'm such as much a part of this sentence as anybody else that I share the gospel to. You know, there's, it's a, it is a study on evangelism, but I'm telling you, why it's different. I'm not talking about evangelism and sharing the gospel to the unbelievers. In this workshop, I'm talking about evangelism as reminding the gospel to us believers, okay? And we need to be reminded of these things. We need to be reminded that we were dead in sins and trespasses, that there was absolutely nothing we could have done to help God, to find grace before God, that it doesn't matter if our families were Christians or were not Christian. It doesn't matter if I had gone to Sunday school for 10, 12 years of my life. It doesn't matter if I'm a good guy, if I treat well my parents. It doesn't matter in the eyes of God. We were all, all of us, dead in sins and trespasses. A dead person can do nothing. It can produce 
Nothing. The only good thing that a dead person is for is to stink. That's the only good thing that a dead person is for. And we have to remind ourselves we were dead. Now, why? Because we forget that. We forget that. And we think we have to earn God's grace as believers. You know, we tell the unbeliever, you don't have to do anything. God will save you by grace. But we believers, we forget that. And we think that we have to earn God's grace. And maybe, maybe it has happened to you that as you are striving for your relationship with God, you feel that if you don't do certain things, you don't have and don't find grace before God. If you don't do your quiet time every morning, if you don't go to all the meetings, if you don't do this or do that, then, man, I'm not in a good position with God. And we hit ourselves. We, you know, we strike ourselves. I'm not saying that you can do whatever you want. I'm saying that we look at these things, which I'm going to go to them later on, as a requirement to be in good stance with God. But look at verse 1. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. And God is the one who initiated His love and His grace for us. You know, um, I mainly deal with uh, youth as we're working with a youth group back in Colombia. But this is something that every young person goes through. You know, as they're struggling with life and they are making difficult decisions, uh, one of the things that draws them away from God, and I've seen that it draws adults away from God, is that fact. Is the fact that uh, maybe they are in a place where they haven't, you know, been really well at doing their quiet time or doing all these things. And they think that first they have to do all these things and then they can be in good stance with God. Like they have to earn the grace of God. Like, no, the reason I don't pray, the reason I don't serve, because I haven't done this. I haven't been doing this. That's not right. Okay. Everything is done by the grace of God. The goodness, the great news of the gospel is we were dead. We walked. Now, now, take a look at how we're described here, okay? We're not just dead. We were following the course of this world. That means our mindset, everything we had in us, just followed the course that this world has. Without Christ, His redeeming grace over us, we would be thinking as anybody else would think in this world. Not just that, but it says that we were following the prince of the power of the air, that we were sons of disobedience, that we would be actually bounder, under the influence of Satan, and we would be as much his spawns as anybody else in this world. Verse 4 is a great, you know, turn. But God, but God, you know, in spite of us not deserving anything, in spite of us being dead, in spite of us just being a part of this world, God, with the love which he, and mercy, and with the love which he loved us, when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. Now, at the end of this, you go to verse 10, and here's where good works do come on. So we go to verse 10, we read, For we are his workmanship. He created us in Christ Jesus again for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what's the place of the good works? What the, what's the place of our quiet times, our meetings, our sharing the gospel, our, you know, all the good works that we can do um, to honor God and Christ? They are a result. They are an answer. They are a purpose of being created and being saved. They're not a requirement, but they are a purpose. They are a result. So, yes, we should be concerned on doing these good works. We should be concerned on finding out what these good works are. I mean, it really astounds me. I mean, look at verse 10. It says that, you know, we've been made, like God designed us. We are His workmanship. Like, everything that you have, your personality, your talents, your gifts, your mistakes, your burdens, everything that you are, you know, God has crafted it and you know, that's a big difference between mass production and handcrafted, right? When you mass product something, you got, I don't know, like a bunch of people in China in a factory doing this, right? And just mass product coming like that. And some of them not really good quality, like 
You see those uh, Disney imitation dolls that it's Hannah, it's uh, Anna from Frozen, but it's spelled like Hannah with like two H, one N, and and it you see like it kind of looks like the toy, but it's not really the toy, right? Uh, and then you have a handcrafted product, right? And maybe you've seen some of those YouTube videos of these handcrafters that you know specialize in doing one product at a time and all the detail they set into that and the intricate parts and delicate parts they try to paste. They try to make each creation unique and special. And here's what God is saying, that through the gospel, because of the gospel, only by grace and only by His mercy, God has handcrafted us made us His workmanship, and all of us have good works which God has prepared beforehand. That strikes me. That surprises me. It means that, you know, just as much as He predestined you to be saved, God has also prepared good works for you. There's, there's a list. There's, there's items. There's things that God has prepared especially for you as an individual that only you can achieve, that only you can do with your personality, with your situation, you know, with your time, with whatever, you know, economic situation you're in, God has good works for you to do right now. You know, the qu question for us is, you know, what are those good works? And that's what drives us to the presence of God. That's what drives us to our knees. That's what drives us to keep our eyes open as God. God, what do you have me to do right now? What is it? You know, my wife has been especially good at teaching me this. As, you know, in our kids are six and four, we're finally seeing the light. But, you know, before that, when they were four and two and all the years before that, um, it was really rough on her to see, you know, what was the good works, what was the purpose that God had for her at that point, you know. Even as the, ch as the children were, like, re newborn, you know, she felt like, you know, all I'm good in life is to give milk and change diapers. Like, I feel that... My purpose in life is to be a cow. That's like, like that's what she felt like. That, that's exactly what she told me. And, and, and I could feel like it was really hard for her because she had come to be like very active, you know, like active in ministry and all the other stuff to not being so active. And the question was, you know, what does God have to do for me here? And it took, it's taking a while. It took a while, you know, in prayer and looking for God. And I'm telling you, it's not an easy thing. But as we look unto Him, He does begin to tell us and to show us, you know, in every situation you have in your life, I have good works. They might not be, you know, this great sharing the gospel to 3,000 people kind of works, but I do have good works for you to find. Uh, maybe it's a good work in which you're learning kindness, learning patience. And now that she's coming out of that situation, we see that that was a time of preparation for her, as now she's being able to be a blessing and stay to the side of other women that are feeling the same way and being with them and encouraging them to keep on pursuing Christ even through that time, uh, which doesn't seem very easy to do it. Um, so God has good works for all of us. And that's the... Th Third thing that I want to remind you is to try to apply, you know, the gospel to daily life as we try to apply the gospel to our marriages, our single lives, our student lives, our working lives. Number three is remind yourself of the gospel frequently. Preach the gospel to yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself. You know, we often spend an awful time listening to ourselves when we ought to be preaching and talking to ourselves. You know, we listen to ourselves, to our self-doubts, to our, all our thoughts, all the things that are in our heads, when we should be reminding us, we should be talking to us, we should be saying, no, 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 remember where you come from, remember the grace that God has given you, remember the position that you are in, remember that you are blessed, you know. That's what the psalmist does, does on his beautiful psalm, right, 103, O my soul, you know, bless the Lord, Oh, my soul, you know, bless his holy name. And oh, my soul, he's saying to himself, like, David, you know, bless him. Remember all of his benefits. You know, we need to do that. And often when we're down, you know, on the downside of our situations and in our marriages and as single men and as children and as fathers, we need to remind ourselves, remember, you know, we know it. You've grown in church. 
You've, you've been to Sundays, uh, you know, probably more days than some people have had in their lifetime, right? Uh, so you know this, but that doesn't mean that you always are aware of it. And that's why we need to remind ourselves of the gospel, to preach ourselves the gospel, to remind us that it's by grace in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every situation that we live in our lives. Now, let me just finish with this um, as we turn to chapter 3. And uh, as we look into that chapter, um, look at that word mystery, okay? Look for the word mystery in chapter 3. In verse uh, 3, we read, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men into other generations, and it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Verse 9, and to bring the light to everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages. Now, uh, when you hear the word mystery, uh, what comes to your mind? What, what other words, synonyms, or how do you understand the word mystery? Things that are hidden from you. Okay, something hidden, thank you. What else? Something can be revealed, okay. Anything else? Good, well, you're a lot more theological than I am, definitely. Because when I understood, one of the first times I was reading mystery, I, I, what came to my mind was not, you know, the revelation or, or hidden, but more the movie kind of stuff, like something mysterious and, you know, maybe spooky and uh, like something dark. Uh, definitely not what Paul is saying here, but how is he using the word mystery, you know? And, and mystery, that word mysterium in uh, Greek has exactly that idea. Something that is hidden and then it is revealed. Something that was, you know, out of sight, but then comes into sight. And here's what we often forget, because we live in a time where we always had the gospel and we live in maybe lives and cultural situations when the gospel has always been available to us, we forget the gospel is a mystery. The gospel is something new. The gospel is the big surprise, the big revelation of God's creation. You see, it goes all the way back, you know, even from Genesis, before the creation, God had this plan. He had the plan of salvation. That's what we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, right? We are predestined, like even from the beginning of the world, like already he had all of this in mind, but nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. You know, he makes man, he puts him in Eden. He has this plan for them, but they don't know. They don't know about Christ. He calls Abraham, he blesses him. He's going to make him a nation. He doesn't know. They have an idea. There's a foreshadowing. There's a faith in something that is coming. But it's a mystery. You know, Old Testament is all centered about the people of Israel. There are here and there, you know, short bits of God telling Israel, you know, you're, you're to be a blessing to all the nations. All the nations will come to know you, uh, to know God through you. But it never gets fulfilled. It is only at the time of Jesus Christ, Christ, when Jesus is revealed, not even then, you know, because it is only then with the Jews and all the apostles being Jews. It's after that, you know, with the apostles and Peter, you know, going to Cornelius' house and being surprised and in awe that these Gentiles are now receiving the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the reasons that they have to speak in tongues is as an external sign that God is really choosing other people. If you go through the book of Acts, you'll see that every instance of 
uh, speaking in tongues in the book of Acts is an instance of revealing that a new group of people is also a part of this new body called the church. You know, the first people in Jerusalem. Then you have the first Samaritans. Then you have Cornelius as the first Gentiles. So all these people are being included and God is saying, yes, this is a mystery. Yes, this was not stated before. This is new, but it was planned. I was to bless all the Gentiles. Now, just as a quick reminder of who we were without the gospel, take a look at verse, chapter 2, verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Five things that describes how miserable we were without Christ. How miserable we were without Him. Even just being Gentiles. Like, we were separated from Christ. The Messiah was not our Messiah. It was the Jews' Messiah. There was no hope for the Messiah to have any change in us. We were alienated from the commonwealth. You know, as an immigrant here, I'm here with a visitor's visa, right? Before that, I was here with a student visa. And that means I'm an alien in this country. That's a, my, my legal status is an alien, uh, an F1 alien. And what does mean is I don't have access to the Commonwealth of the United States. I don't have access to you know, federal student loans. I don't have access to uh, tax reliefs. I don't have access to all that because that is money that only belongs to people who are a part of the nation, who are not aliens. This is who we were. This is where we stand without Christ. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Now we're so used to reading the Old Testament, just go through any passage or go through a psalm and quickly to say, oh, that's for me. You know, we apply it to our lives. That's correct. I mean, we can do it now, but don't take it for granted, you know. There's a reason you can apply that to our lives. There's a reason that that psalm gives you comfort because through the power of the gospel, the incredible, incredible power of the gospel, now we're not alienated from the commonwealth. We are a part of the people of God. His promises are now our promises. We are no longer strangers to the covenants. We are part, we're given those covenants. Before we had no hope, now we have hope. Before we were without God in the world, now we have God in this world. So we are made one, we're given unity in Christ. So as we conclude this workshop, just wanted you to remember these items, you know. Um, why do we disconnect the gospel from daily lives? Because we often forget the gospel ourselves. We forget of all the blessings that we have in our position in Christ. And we need to remind that and we need to abide in that position. We forget the power of prayer that is needed to apply the gospel, to apply those truths, to really know them and live them out. And we just try to, you know, live in automatic mode and think that because we've always been, you know, Christians or lived in a Christian environment, we should behave as Christians, but that doesn't happen. We need the power of God in order to apply those truths. We forget the message of the gospel. We forget where we come from and why we need His grace. And everything we have in life is by His grace and His power and not by us. And we forget how undeserving we were and what our position was before Christ. So we stop being grateful. You know, that last point, you see that in, in, in families throughout generations, right? You have the first generation of immigrants and the first generation that comes, they have to, you know, scratch their nails. Like they really suffer, right? They, they work the three jobs, the non-professional jobs, the cleaning toilet jobs, and everything they have, they value. Like every single thing that they can acquire, if it's a, an old car, maybe, maybe it's a used car, an old car, but they work so hard for that car, they value that car, they take care of that car. You know, they're, they're always thankful. Then you have the second generation. The second generation saw their parents work, 
but they had a easier life, right? Their parents worked hard so they could live a little better. They didn't have all the commodities. They didn't have everything they wanted. They have some of it, but they saw how hard it was. So they understand, they're grateful, okay? But they themselves didn't have to do so much. Now, the third generation comes, and this second generation were able to study, become professionals. Now they have money, and they're giving the third generation, you know, what they can. So this third generation never has to work for things. They, you know, have everything they want, every toy they desire, every, they, they don't think, I have a restriction to apply to schools. They can, like, you know, the, the world is my oyster. Like, what, should, what school do I want? And often in these third generations, what you hear from the first is, hey, you're ungrateful. You don't take value of things. You don't take care of things. Why is that? You know, because this generation knows how much it costs. This generation has forgotten the cost. You know, and we don't want to be that third generation. That's, I want every single believer to be a first generation believer. You know, we do talk about generational believers, right? First generation, second generation, third generation. Honestly, in reality, we should all be first generation because we were all dead in our sin and trespasses. No matter if you're born in a second generation home or third generation home, eighth generation home, you were dead. And like, you were born an unbeliever. You are the first generation of you to become a believer, right? So just having that type of attitude really helps, and we need to rescue that. So if you are in a further generation, I don't mean that to offend you. I just mean that to, you know, rescue that, pray for that, strive for that, to understand the cost of the gospel, how undeserving of it you are, and that will lead you to have a grateful heart. That will eventually lead you to apply the gospel to daily life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love, especially as we have come to know it through your incredible gospel, the good news that although we were dead, although we did not deserve anything from you, Father, um, although we were your enemies, and the only thing, God, that we really deserved was your wrath, God, you looked upon us with love and with mercy. You've prepared so many blessings for us, God. From eternity past, God, you have prepared this beautiful plan to give your only and your one Son, Jesus Christ, so that he would die for me, so that he would redeem me, so that he would be the one who would rescue me from my sins. God, I come before you and I pray and I bow down before you, Lord, asking you that you would open all of our eyes this morning, God, that you would give us the understanding, God, that you would allow us, Father, to truly comprehend that hope which we have in you, that hope into which we have called that you would let us see how wide and tall and deep the breath of the love of Christ, God, that we may be surprised by it again, that we may be in love with it again, that we may have that first love, God, that we had when we first understood this and we first understood how undeserving we were. Even if we've never had it, God, even if we maybe never had that first love, God, we want to love you in that way. We understand that that love will come through you, so we pray, God, work in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, so that we may come to know your love. God, help us to remember the gospel and the good news of Christ and help us to apply that truth into our daily living, into our daily lives, and to every area of our walk. Thank you, Father, for your love, your grace, your mercy. We surrender this time to you, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well.